destiny of Russia as a people, as a nation, has become the agricultural breadbasket of the world. Like, our, our destiny is to feed the world. My parents came over in the 90s, uh, 1994, right as the Soviet Union fell apart. They were missionaries, and so I kind of grew up in Russia. Uh, when we moved over here, I was 11, so I spent my teenage years, sort of formative years, growing up in a little village up north in Russia. I was 18 uh, in 2000 when I told my parents that I was gonna can my plans to go to the university. I was gonna head back to Russia. Uh, so that's how I ended up back in Russia in the early 2000s. And uh, for four years, I lived in the city of Krasnyarsk. Uh, did work with orphans, did some, some different, different kind of humanitarian missions. And in 2004, uh, the Lord led me up north to help pastor a little church. And then I've been working in rural village ministry and living in the villages and in rural areas ever since then. So uh, in a nutshell, missionary kid to missionary to now Russian farmer person. <laughs> That's kind of the, the route. When I decided to come back to Russia, it wasn't a, you know, I'm going to build the best potential career that I could have. I'm going to make the most amount of money that I could make. Like, of course, if you're going to do that, stay in the States, right? Uh, it was a definite call. Like, I really felt that the Lord, that God spoke to me and said, come back to Russia. You'll be more useful for the kingdom of God there. I did all kinds of different things. You know, I repaired computers. I tried, you know, importing iPhones at some point and selling those in the city. I did all kinds of different things to try to support myself. 2009, I was like, you know what? I've been trying all these things, but I'm living in a village. Like everyone around here does subsistence farming. Maybe I should just like try farming. And so then 2009, uh, I tried, we, we started our first little uh, cow farm. We bought three cows and grew that to about 10, 10 head of milk, milk cows. Um, then we later on started a little goat farm, uh, started with about eight goats and then grew that to about 20 goats and just learned the ropes for about six years, learned how to farm and became successful at it. And I started having some really serious issues with asthma about 2011, 2010, 2011. Every fall I was in the hospital, I had pneumonia like six times uh, and then asthma attacks that were almost fatal a couple of times, like literally just barely saved me. 2016, went on a big giant road trip and looked at land all over the place and breathed. And we found that the Altai region just had beautiful air and you could actually breathe and it was great. There was land for sale, just beautiful, amazing place. All the kind of things you could ever possibly dream of. The air was good, there was no asthma, asthma villages around, you know, all those things that we were looking for. So uh, 2016, that's we, we bought this land and started building the farm here, uh, the new farm. So our land here, uh, just to give an idea of what, we, what we're looking at here, from the corner there to the far corner is three and a half kilometers. It's like, I don't know, two miles. And that is our little land. That's 100 hectares, 240 acres. main thing is we do goats. We have 62 milking goats yeah. and 100 sheep. And this is our barn. Uh, I always try to do some sort of experiments, trying to make things uh, work out differently or better. So we try to do this with an underground barn. So this is an earth well, shelter. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a bunker barn. <laughs> bunker <This> barn. <laughs> the main idea was to get the cost down. Yeah. So uh, to, to bring the cost down so significantly and also to make sure that it stayed warm through the winter. Not so much for the animals, they can handle, like even if it gets a little bit below freezing, that's not a, but to have automated watering so you didn't have to do the watering by hand and stuff. Like I said, this is our experimental underground bunker barn. But we built it like, kind of the idea is that try to do as much as we can automated so you can drive through, as you can see, you can come in these gates mm -hmm. and drive out all the way through. We can either drive our horses through or our tractor through to do feeding, to clean out the animals. On the right side here, we've got a big long stall for goats. We've got 62 milking goats right now. On the left side, we've got a big long stall for sheep. 
We have 100 sheep right now uh, that we're running here. Soon, here in the spring, we'll start milking again. It takes us about two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. Me and the girls, we do all the milking ourselves, so I'm like the head milk guy, and then my girls help me. We also have a pig in the far corner um, at the end, and a bunch of chickens in the other far corner at the end. Uh, right here, we've got our grain, grain bunkers. Uh, there's a secondary grain bunker outside, we'll bring in grain that way. So yeah, that's the barn. So you're very popular online. What do you think is the source of your popularity? 2014, there were the sanctions from the West, then there was the counter sanctions from Russia, the agricultural import-export sanctions. Russia Channel One picked it up. And they came up 45 minutes. They were trying to get me to say something uh, positive about the sanctions. Because it was like, don't you think the sanctions are the greatest thing since sliced bread for Russian farmers? And I was like, no. Don't you think it's gonna really help the Russian economy? No. Don't you think? <laughs> it was just like, it was this long, long interview. And finally, at the very end, I, I just was like, well, I guess there is one positive thing. And I told this little anecdote of, like, before when we go down to the city and try to sell our mozzarella, people would say, why should we buy your mozzarella from up north when we can buy Italian mozzarella? And I was like, well, try it. It's really good, you know, like, at least give it a try. Like, it's a little bit cheaper and, you know, give it a try. Oh, we, don't, we won't even give it a try. We can buy Italian mozzarella. But now, of course, you know, where is your Italian mozzarella? Ha, 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 And I made this big laugh. <laughs> and that little tiny piece of that interview got taken out of context, like stuck into a, uh, into a video. That little piece went viral online. Um, I went out to hay. A week later, I come back from the hay fields and it's like, everything is just overflowing. Inbox is overflowing. SMS is just, just it just went viral, just went wild. Interviews galore. And I was just like, what happened? So then I was like, did another video, again, went up against that same fence, did a second video follow-up explaining how I'm really not for the sanctions. Like that was taken out of context. And so then that went viral, kind of in the liberal side of things. So you kind of had the pro uh, regime people using my video as like, oh look, he's for, like, oh, this is a good thing, right? And then you had sort of the, the more liberal sort of, no, no, actually he's again. <laughs> funny double whammy left right and so then that kind of just launched my online I guess um, situation and I've kept up the blog since then that's that's kind of the long and short of it <laughs> so. and now on the outside the other side of the barn and we're kind of looking at what I call the tea house and one of the things that was a big surprise for us when we moved to the Altai region was all of the natural occurring herbs and different kinds of grass that you can use for medicinal purposes. Yeah. My wife started really studying that and we just a few years ago built the tea house as a special dryer and we make all kinds of herbs and that turned out to be the least amount of investment on the entire farm and the most profitable thing that we've ever done. <laughs> so if I would have if I would have known when we moved out here, I would have never bought the goats. Like <laughs> I just put up a bunch of tea houses. <laughs> and we we put up, you know, you know, a lot of tea every year now. And this this next year is gonna be a huge year for us. But like last year, we sold out our entire year supply of tea in like three weeks. Like it was just insane. I've got about a, about a quarter acre of garden right there, and that feeds the four families that live here oh. on the farm. That's my family, my wife, and my uh, three kids. Yeah. And there's three other families. Uh, each of those families, the heads of the household, work, uh, they're, they're employed here, yeah. and then their wife and children. Wow, so that's crazy. So. You actually take on the wife and kids of your workmen. Well, yeah. That's, that's actually really cool. I don't think I've ever seen that before. We provide so. housing, so yeah. like they can live here on the farm, and we also provide a, uh, what I call in Russian, a, like a basket of food. Like So every, every week yeah. they get you know, a certain amount of honey, a certain amount of you know, all the different staples that you yeah. need. So our, the, the salary isn't great, like it's not like a big salary, but well, all your expenses are covered, so everything you get, you can just put into the bank. You 
have to give a lot of interviews, met a lot of people, these TV stations. What kind of questions do they ask you? Now, the first question is like, you know, what did you forget in Russia, right? Connected with the idea of, you know, we live in such an awful country, everywhere is better than here. And the reality is, is that Russia probably hasn't lived up to its full potential in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, things could have been done better uh, to develop the country better and, and more rapidly economically and so forth. But it's not, a, it's not a bad place to live. My first thing that I try to impress on Russians who ask that question is, look, look around, man. Like, you live in this amazing, giant country that, you know, is just a miracle that it exists at all. With the amount of lack of population that Russia has, and always historically has had a small population, surrounded on all sides by, well, not on all sides, but at least on the southern border by the, you know, the billions of Asia, that, that shouldn't be there. It's the existence of Russia as a nation is something on the level of a miracle. It shouldn't be, and yet it is. So like that, first of all, is a, is a huge miracle. Second thing is like, look at the world. Like one of the main things that we're, that we're heading towards and seem to have been heading for for the last 50, 60 years, like the 1960s Green Revolution kind of postponed the inevitable tragedy of a food crisis. Russia has got the largest amount of, as, as the Russians say, black dirt that's unused in the moment, uncultivated black dirt in the world. We've got the largest amount of fresh water supply. We've got wonderful insulation. We've got actually pretty decent conditions for, for agriculture. Like our, the Russian fate, our, our destiny is to feed the world. Like let's stand up and, and fulfill that destiny. Like that is the destiny of Russia. So I bought this 100 hectares uh, four years ago for 1.4 million rubles, right? So that's- What point that, yeah, what? 14,000 rubles a hectare. You know, that's $200 for 2.4 acres. That's, that's less than $100 an acre, right? I can make that back on hay. Like, just using the, the grass that's here, wild grass, not even cultivated grass. Just mow that and you can pay that back in three years. And people are like, oh, land is so expensive. I'm like, yeah, right. I'm, I'm trying to buy as much land as I possibly can. Anything that comes up around, we're trying to buy it. 50 years down the road, 40 years down the road, 30 years down the road. How much is this land going to cost? Look at the price of agriculture and land in Eastern Europe. That's how much it's going to cost. You know, we're, we're talking about $4,000, $5,000 an acre. That's what it's going to cost. So, so this is the thing, you know, buy land, invest in land. And that's what I tell all the Russians. So we've been here on the Altai for just over four years. Yeah. Uh, we bought this land in 2016, October 16th, 2016. And when we first moved into this area, this, this field was just a field, like just hay field, nothing here, mm. no power, no water, nothing. And we unpacked these yurts, set up three yurts, set up a generator, dug that toilet, put it in, and that was that. So this is where we started with, was with this homestead. We, we My family, there was five of us, so me and my wife and my three kids, we lived in that year for two years wow. um, as we built everything else around us. Yeah. And then from here, we built the banya, which is the you know, Russian bathhouse. It's like an absolute necess necessity on every farm. Yeah. And then we built everything else, um, the barn, every everything else out from there. Uh, I'm not asking for government handouts. I basically just don't want the government to bother us. But at the moment, as things stand today, you have a three-tiered regulatory environment for farmers, which basically means that if you're a very small operator, you can almost do almost zero regulatory oversight. Like literally, you know, the vet visits you twice a year and you can sell your meat and milk and everything and it's just fine, right? There's a second level, which is like for medium-sized producers, there's a little bit more paperwork. And then there's a large level for like corporate entities. Like this is a very sane agricultural policy. And it means that somebody small like us can come in, set up shop and actually build up a business before you have to jump onto this huge regulatory bandwagon. And it's, it's really a good thing. This year, it looks like we may um, get some equipment subsidized. Like right now they have a program where the Russian government will pay somewhere around 40 to 50% on if you can buy new equipment. Another big uh, subsidy program that they have for us, we're right now off the grid, which is great, we're fine with that. 
but we applied for rural electrification like two years ago and it looks like it's actually going to happen which is insane because like to bring power out here uh by just you know uh, just by paying for it like hundred fifty thousand dollars like it's an impossible like but they'll bring it out here and it's going to cost us like 500 bucks I'm not, I'm not looking for the kind of handouts that a lot of Russians think of. Like, I'm not getting free land. I'm not getting grants, money grants. I'm not getting that kind of stuff. But the subsidy, that's a big thing. The regulatory environment, that's a big thing. Low taxes, that's a big thing. Electri rural electrification, that's a huge thing. Like, what else can you ask for, right? On this property here, we paid last year, uh, 2020, we paid $150, like 10,000 rubles in property tax. Um, so that was for you know the, the four house, the houses, all the whole farm that you guys just saw, and then of course the 100 hectares, 240 acres. So right here we've got the powerhouse. It's the sort of, as far as energy goes, the main driver of everything on the farm. So uh, we have 10 solar panels. That's 350 watts each on a, you know, so theoretically three and a half kilowatts. But the main thing that keeps us going is the hydroelectric station, which is down in the creek bottom um, oh. that I put together myself. So that system is really the, the, the saver because that gives us, you know, right around 15 kilowatts a day. Um, so with the kilowatts that we get from the panels, which is on a sunny day, is about 10. Yeah. Uh, with the 15 from the hydroelectric station, it gives us about 25 kilowatts a day. And that gives us about what we need to run the whole farm. We also have a couple of little generators that we run for backup if we need that. And I also have a, as you can see it right there, there's a gasifier uh, where I use it to convert wood materials into uh, a burnable gas that I then can run into an internal combustion engine and produce electricity off of, a, off uh, of dude, electricity. I, 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 I've, been, <laughs> dude, uh, I've been around this planet a lot and that's the first time I've ever heard of that. Yeah, it's an old uh, technology that was actually mass produced in World War II, oh. but, uh, but we rebuilt that machine from um, plans. I'm gonna get what's called a Stirling engine. I've already ordered it. Uh, there's a Russian guy who makes them. They're awesome. Oh. And they're, it's a it's a external combustion engine, like a steam engine, except for not steam. It's a hot air engine. Yeah. So you can just burn the, the, the fuel on the outside from the gasifier. Even if it's kind of sticky, it doesn't matter because you just clean it off with a, with a brush. Yeah. And, it ha and it runs, and it's going to give us about 700, 800 watts. So that'll be our new backup, and I'm really excited about that. So solar, uh, hydro, and gasifier, that's our main. Gasifier. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have to open up a Wikipedia article when I get to yeah, the hotel. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. That, yep. That's cool. So that's the energy setup here on the farm. Are you getting uh, sick of being far away from civilization at all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, civilization is where we're at. We bring civilization. Civilization is a state of mind, not a not a place on the map. I've got power. I've got running water. You know, I've got radiators that give me heat. You know, I stoke the fire once a, once a day, and I got plenty of all, all the all everything that you that you'd kind of associate with living in the city or what the Russians would call civilization. School, we home educate. I would do that anyway, even if I lived in downtown Moscow, or especially if I lived in downtown Moscow. The one thing I guess for us that is the med medical care uh, is a little bit lacking. Uh, what we would like the local hospitals kind of below par. We just had a situation with my youngest daughter who. Uh, had a ruptured appendix and we had to run her to the hospital. We actually ran her to Beesk. That's 200 kilometers, three hours. It's a little bit far. So we provide the civilization for ourselves. And, and that's, I think this is the most important thing is like, what am I as a human being? Am I a thermostat or a thermometer? Do I reflect the temperature in the room or do I set the temperature? And my desire is of course, to myself be a thermostat and to train my children to be the same that we, were, we are the ones who set the temperature, not the ones who just reflect it. And we can live almost with no money here on this land uh, because we grow all of our own vegetables, we have all our own meat, we've got all our own milk, we've got all our own eggs, we've got our own power. Like all of those things, like literally, I could retrench and live for a couple of years on no money. This is our sort of heat source. Everyone's all crazy about alternative energy, like, oh, you know, great, solar power. And I, I think alternative energy is pretty cool, as long as you don't have any other alternative. <laughs> and this uh, basically outdoor boiler is the solution for most of our heating needs. So we pipe into the house, 
and we heat our domestic hot water yeah. with this. Yeah. We heat the house yeah. with this. We also use this as a heat source to do all of our cheese production. So we, we moved in, and like I said, and, and lived in the yurt for two years and built the, the whole infrastructure, the barn, the, all the stuff. And then also at the same time we're building this. This is our house slash production facility. So the first story is completely production. There's a cheese kitchen and a meat kitchen. And then the second story is like a, just kind of a general sort of dining room, uh, kitchen, and then our my bedroom and our children's bedroom upstairs. You live in Russia as a foreigner, as an American. Like, you were on a visa, and then, okay, well, I guess I get my temporary residency permit, might as well. And, okay, well, I might as well get my, you know, residency permit, permanent residency permit, visa, visa, so. And so I got all that done. But still, you know, I'm just a foreigner, you know, that's fine. But you start thinking, like, I spent 18 years of my life here. I might as well, like, am I, am I really going to do something different? Am I going to go home, like, home? Like, this is a strange thing, like, where is home? Well, is home where your children are? Is home where your wife is, where your, where your house is, where your business is, where your church is, where your work is? Like, yeah, that's definitely home for me. So the idea of getting citizenship came to mind, and I started working towards it, and it was just like this nightmare of bureaucracy where one thing was wrong, then another thing was wrong, and like, continue, continue. But long story short, this year I'm finally, um, Yesterday, actually, I just finished the submission process, finally submitted the last uh, level of documents to get uh, citizenship, and hopefully within three months, the results of that will come back. Um, and if all is well, then uh, sometime mid-summer, I'll have, have a Russian passport. I'm very happy with the level of the size of farm that we have. I want to make it efficient. I want to make it as profitable as it possibly can be at this size. I'm not interested in growing it. What I am interested in growing is the rural culture, showing Russians that look, having a, you know, a nice place, having a farm, being a landowner, there is something noble and awesome about that. Not just grow my farm, but grow farmers, like produce a spirit of agriculture and like country rural kind of spirit. And the most important thing is to, is to produce a vision of a noble farmer, the, the noble gentleman, you know, farmer. Not the, you know, collective farmer worker who's just completely, you know, up to his knees and as the Russians say, like up to his knees in manure, you know, but, but a real person who lives on the land and, and thrives, doesn't just survive, but thrives. And, and the scripture says that the people perish for lack of vision. And I guess my great dream would be to, to, to help provide that vision. Because again, like I said, I'm not gonna feed Asia on my own. Like, but 10,000, 100,000 million Russian farmers who, who catch that vision and you know, buy acreage, go out there, start doing it, that's what we need. So that's what I hope to provide. Okay, friends, so bad situation here. Despite renting an extremely expensive car, the tires on it are garbage. So the situation looks like this. We were leaving his home late at night. 9.30. We pulled, 9.30, <laughs> late at night by our standards. We pulled to the side of the road, made a turn, and kaboom, the tire explodes, right? So what do we have to do? He lives in complete and total isolation. In the middle of the night, after screwing around with all these tires and stuff, we had to walk five kilometers all the way back. But thank you very much for not being angry for waking your kids and all that. Hey, no so problem. we slept in your cheese making room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that was the adventure, guys. So uh, one thing I don't recommend you do on your vacation, five kilometer hike through the darkness of the Altai Mountains. All right, that's the story. There thank you, you again. Oh boy.